Yes, greetings to our friends and uh, colleagues who are here. Uh, we are so happy that you have joined our session. Our topic is conducting ethically responsible research among marginalized groups on sensitive topics. Our work, when I say our, I'm referring to Pavel and myself and also some of our colleagues, we have uh, focused on marginalized groups considering that we have conducted several qualitative research on people who are marginalized. And lately, uh, Pavel and I have uh, conducted a, a topic that's very uh, of great interest to us, and that is on cohabitation. And so this is the this study has inspired us to talk about marginalized groups and sensitive topics and how to conduct ethical um, research among these groups. And Pavel, can we continue? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for inviting us to present for this uh, respective community and. We are honored to be a part of this uh, qualitative research family around the globe. Um, as you uh, uh, just mentioned that uh, this is just, uh, you know, this topic is very broad and we have many, uh, um, you know, angles of on this. Uh, so we'll just touch, basically touch on this area, but uh, there's much more that we can, uh, you know, present for these 45 minutes. I would like to begin uh, with um, um, yeah, introducing our both schools, uh, Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies and also Adventist University of the Philippines. We are neighbors, we are uh, apart, uh, 15 kilometers apart. Um, and we are, of course, we are collaborating and uh, we are happy to present this together. Um, I'd like to begin with this uh, uh, painting uh, by uh, one Japanese girl, uh, she wanted to uh, to um, emphasize the the fr fragile world that is around us. The world is that is fragmented. And she painted uh, this uh, uh, the the child and um, uh, the cherries, um, uh, sakura cherries that uh, are uh, spread around. And uh, this is how she wanted to. Uh, emphasize this idea of uh, um, fragility uh, of uh, of uh, of the world and our relationships, uh, and it is true we live in the world that is very fragile, and relationships are getting more and more difficult among people. And when we it comes to our studies, research studies, this is especially true when it comes to some um, sensitive topics or dealing with some marginalized groups. So I will probably begin with some definitions and um, uh, the vulnerable, the word vulnerable comes from the Latin vulnus, uh, which means wound uh, or vulnerare, that means to wound, to, to make a wound. Uh, the Webster dictionary says uh, marginalized um, or vulnerable, vulnerable is a weak and easily hurt physically or emotionally. And Howard Stone says the vulnerable are those who are likely to be susceptible to coercive or undue influence. Uh, when it comes to qualitative research, we understand that qualitative research, unlike uh, quantitative, it goes deeper uh, to the level of relationship with people. Um, it uh, the 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 thrust of qualitative research is. Uh, um, dealing with touching people's lives and uh, going deeper into their experience. Uh, at the same time, uh, because uh, our uh, us uh, as researchers, we are instruments. Uh, we are dealing with the people face to face and um, uh, personally. So people may also feel uh, their uh, inferiority and our superiority. Uh, it also produces uh, unnecessary. Um, um influence or uh it contributes to to this uh, vulnerability vulnerability issue um and yes uh, when we conduct uh, research on sensitive and emotionally laden topics 
it also uh, adds to to this um, uh, issue on um, um, participant uh, research relationships where um, uh, we can be emotionally wounded and we can also uh, you know harm our participants uh, not even sometimes realizing it um, when uh, also we research vulnerable groups we need to understand the risks and uh, some uh, uh, implications what uh, may happen when we do it um, there is also understanding that um, it's not only about vulnerable groups uh, of course we we know that vulnerable groups are those that are more susceptible to uh, to um, this harm and uh, danger of, of uh, uh, unethical behavior. But at the same time, we also have uh, um, other groups that seem to be normal. They're not uh, belonging to vulnerable, but uh, at the same time, they, they can be also vulnerable if we look at the categories of, uh, you know, that potential risk. Um, and uh, where we say about potential vulnerability is a cognitive area. Uh, we are dealing with uh, people sometimes they, they may not be visibly belonging to vulnerable group, but uh, at the same time, they may be vulnerable due to some cognitive uh, issues or medical uh, conditions. Uh, people may also belong to vulnerable group uh, because of the medical issues. Um, allocational, uh, depending on uh, where they are and what happens to them at, 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 at this time. Uh, then infrastructural, uh, when the, the people are um, um, tight or let's say uh, pressured by the, their infrastructure, you know, what, what is happening around them, it can be um, uh, societal uh, issue or more on a political issue. Um, yeah, then uh, differential uh, or judicious. So that different different ways of how people can be um, can be uh, in potential risk of of uh, unethical behavior. Uh, they they can be uh, vulnerable people. So the question that we can ask: Are we to safe to say? Uh, are we safe to say that if the participant does not fit any of aforementioned categories of potential risk, there is no risk of being harmed of the participant and or the researcher? And the answer is uh, um, no. Uh, everyone can be vulnerable. That's uh, the answer. As we design our studies, uh, writes uh, um, Maria Lachman. Dr. Maria Lachman is. Uh, um, well known for uh, her ethical books on ethics uh, in qualitative research. She says, we need to hold all the human participants as capable and competent, yet potentially vulnerable. So um, that is the, um, uh, the premise that we stand on, that uh, everyone can be vulnerable at some point of time and at some moment of life. Uh, we may be in that uh, uh, risk uh, group. Uh, for the marginalized groups, uh, we may uh, think of uh, women, uh, children, the poor, elderly people, ethnic, different ethnic groups, ethnic minorities, and maybe mentally handicapped people and other groups. Uh, we may not include them all here, but um, this is uh, what we understand under clearly marginalized groups, uh, although there are some other groups and uh, we may also, um, as I said, um, we need to see the potentially uh, potential vulnerability as we belong to different categories at, at some point of time. Uh, sensitive issues. Uh, as I said, uh, qualitative research is uh, dealing with some uh, really sensitive issues and uh, <clears throat> Sometimes uh, uh, our research is dealing with uh, uh, traumatized people uh, or um, studying, being studied, uh, you know, we study something related to trauma uh, or some other uh, phenomenon that may be also sensitive. So we need to understand the, the risks and the potential for, uh, for um, 
vulnerability uh, when we do these sensitive uh, studies. Uh, so um, based on this, uh, we need to develop uh, special approaches to the people who are, we are studying uh, to be ethically responsible. Uh, we are talking about uh, the area of prostitution, abortion, HIV, AIDS, or cohabitation, as we will talk more about it, teen motherhood or LGBTQ, for example. Uh, and not uh, limited to this list, we have much more topics uh, on uh, you know sensitive issues. So Dr. Sally, you may continue now with the examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we thought of uh, how we can exemplify and we draw our examples, our case examples from the works that we have done. And Jenny was a teen mother who was one of our participants in um, our teen motherhood study. And we did this uh, I mean, we did the teen motherhood study um, in a place that was not really mine. What we did was we got a local to help us. So uh, she she went. So this local person was part of our research team. And she went to the rural health unit and asked for nominees for our study. And uh, one of those was Jenny. So uh, we, we conducted the study. We stayed in the site for about two weeks because uh, this was a photo voice. So this was a study on uh, teen motherhood using photo voice. So we engaged with our participants for about two weeks. At first, uh, in the Philippines, culturally, uh, while there is, I would say, uh, greater acceptance of teen mothers, there are still, uh, in some places, teen motherhood is not yet uh, widely accepted, although, yes, in some it's tolerated, but there is still a sort of stigma. So um, Jenny was shy, but as we continued to engage with her, on an almost daily basis because of the nature of photo voice, she began to warm up. And I want to underscore here how we can empower marginalized groups who are um, in, you know, dealing with sensitive issues. And what really struck me was during the we held a photo exhibit at the end of uh, our data collection, and it was in the municipal hall. And we were waiting for our participants, also for other members of the community to come. And when Jenny went down of a motor, we call it in our place motorella, but it's like a short, you know, a vehicle with the motorbike and when she uh, went down of that vehicle you know and she came to toward the venue one of our research team members you know tapped my shoulder and said look look at Jenny she walks like a queen and truly that was my impression and I was really touched by that one that uh, research, the power of research to inspire, to give confidence to marginalized groups. The next example is we call her Miriam. By the way, this one, these are not the real pictures and these are not the real names. The other one is Miriam. Pavel, kindly move to the next slide. Miriam yes. is our one of our participants in our cohabitation study. You see, we belong to um, a denominational group, a religion. We are Adventist, and uh, among among our circle, uh, cohabitation is is yes tolerated. There are some uh, church members uh, who engage in this one, but the acceptance. I would say is uh, moderately low. And Miriam 
is a uh, what is a mother and has children of her own and her husband uh, uh, died but uh, she could not have she could not be legally married to the person because of some impediments she's living with uh, what is very significant about Miriam was her openness to talk about her situation and uh, for Pavel and me it we have been also intentional in showing our acceptance and so we realize that it is possible to talk about sensitive topics with marginalized groups even to people whom we know or are closely related with. Jenny is an example of a person, uh, a participant whom we as researchers did not have prior relationship. Miriam is an example of a participant with whom we have prior relationship. And our understanding now is that it is possible to get good data only if we uh, as researchers are probably properly trained how to collect data on sensitive topics with marginalized groups. And so these uh, two examples are our inspiration why we are having this conversation with you. So the question is how do we uh, uh, collect uh, data and do that in an ethically responsible way. Uh, there are several frameworks, ethical frameworks, and Pavel and I have chosen one of these frameworks. And this is the framework of uh, Amdor and Bankert. In this framework, there are this framework has three components, and these are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Uh, under each component, there are several strategies here, and we will uh, discuss this one one by one. Okay, so respect for persons. What does that mean? And how, how do we do that? There are several strategies, and we have not exhaustively included all, but I, we believe these are the most important ones. Uh, the first here is informed consent. What does informed consent mean? When we are dealing with marginalized groups uh, on sensitive issues, the first here is we want to emphasize that we give our participants adequate information, full disclosure of uh, what our study is about, what research procedures we are going to follow. So, uh, for example, we can disclose, you know, we can even disclose to them before we engage or we get their consent. We can show to them that we, uh, the, the interview questions, the interview guide. We share also, we disclose with them uh, what their involvement will be in terms of time. Uh, I think that is only fair in terms of number of days, how long, also what their rights are, what their benefits are, and also disclose to them the possible harm. Also check whether they have fully understood what we say and what we write in the informed consent form. And this is really... Uh, very important for minors because uh, they cannot give the consent fully in them, on themselves. So we involve their parents, we involve their guardians, and also to those who are, uh, I mean, who lack cognitive ability. So we also have to consult uh, significant persons who will uh, give the consent. So also, one way to show our respect in terms of informed consent is that we also, we do not get one-time consent, but rather process consent. And I want to, uh, uh, I mean, mention here the name of uh, uh, Martin Tolley. 
because uh, for me, he is the person who has guided me through the uh, what process consent is, how it is done, and why that is very important. The other is voluntary participation. We emphasize to our participants that they have the right to withdraw at any point. And here we emphasize that, especially on sensitive topics, we can tell them, you know, after even after uh, my data collection, and after I send to you the document for member check, you can withdraw. You can tell me that you will not allow me to use your data. You can do that. And uh, we have to assure them that there will be no penalty or prejudice if they do this one. The other uh, strategy here is confidentiality. How do, how, okay, the other one is no coercion. Now, Pavel mentioned that when we are dealing with marginalized groups as researchers, there may be already a type of coercion there. There can be power distance, uh, especially in places uh, like Asia. The power distance is, is high. What do we mean by power distance? This is like, okay, I belong to a marginalized group. The researcher is a PhD. The researcher comes from a university. That alone, uh, you know, uh, the, the gap is, is high. And uh, in Asia, you know, we are talking about Asia because Pavel and I, although Pavel is not from Asia, he is Russian, but he has been here. Uh, in Asia. In Asia, culturally, you know, when somebody higher uh, uh, asks you something, it's like uh, because of our culture, we have the tendency to say yes, even though we think we should say no. And so it, with marginalized groups, that's, that's true. And uh, students can also be marginalized. So if a professor asks a student, like, will you participate in my study, that can alone can have some uh, nuances of coercion. And sometimes researchers can um, inject coercion in a jokingly way. But as researchers, I think we should not do that. Now for confidentiality, uh, Researchers should employ strategies to keep participants' identity hidden. That's a bit difficult. And we can do this by using pseudonyms. But I remember I read, uh, Pavel, I don't know if I have shared with you the, the article of Carol Ellis, where uh, I, I think Dr. Tolik also mentioned about that, where... Uh, the participants were able to, I, I think even the community reading the work were able to identify who the people, who the participants were in spite of the use of pseudonyms. So uh, so that's, a, a, that's difficult. We do not have the answer how you really protect your participants. But what we can say is yes, we'll use pseudonyms. We will do a composite reporting. I think there's a term there. I think the term is fabrication where uh, mm -hmm. I remember that we did a study on um, the portrait of a superwoman and uh, we we put together, we constructed a poem as part of our conclusion, and we just put together the, the findings without identifying who the participants who said or did what. And of course, the other one is review your work before you publish, ensuring that uh, because aside from keeping the name hidden, identity can be, there are some elements that may point to the person. Uh, like, for example, you say, uh, let me cite my situation. You say, I, I conducted a research. The participant is uh, the a woman president of the Adventist University of the Philippines. Now, in the history of my school, I am the only woman university president. So even if you don't mention my name, I will be identified. 
So let us uh, take note of this. The other one is data security about data storage and management. We disclose to our participant what we are going to do with the data, who has access to the data. Now, if you are doing a dissertation, do not claim that you are the only person who has access to the data because your methodologist or your advisor may ask you to show to him or to her the raw data. And in some cases, yes, the, the student has to show the data to the uh, advisor or to the methodologist. And you have to disclose that one, be transparent and where the data is stored, how long it will be stored. You have to disclose this to your participant. Now, uh, the other one here is relevance of relevance of data. Uh, there is a tendency that in the interview, the participant may talk on and on and on. So what do we do is, of course, we listen. But there may be some points where, as researcher, once you notice that the data is no longer relevant to your study, you may turn off the recorder. Or if you are not able to turn off the recorder, you can do during the member check, ask your participant in a very intentional way, uh, would you like me to include this part? Or, you know, there were times, Pavel, that I myself did not just include the data in the transcription mm -hmm. because uh, I sense that I did not need the data. And in my dissertation experience with women university presidents, uh, I, when I showed to them the transcript, they indicated, delete this one. I was just carried away with my storytelling. And sometimes the good thing with my experience with university women university presidents was, of course, uh, because perhaps of their experience with research, uh, there were times they said, this one is off the record. Turn off your, your recorder. But uh, we should be very mindful that the data we collect are only those uh, relevant. And how do we ensure? Well, uh, we should have a way of doing that, that when we formulate our interview guide, we match it, we match the, res the interview questions with our research questions, okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, also during ethical moments, um, uh, the work of Gilliam and Gulliemen, they cited some examples where the participants disclosed really very intimate information not related to the study. And they call this one ethical moments. And of course, they did not include this. Safety of the participants. Well, on sensitive topics, we want to suggest that please do not use focus group discussion on sensitive topics. Why? Because then the, the I mean, the uh, very, how do we say, um, confidential information shared will be heard by the other participants. So uh, when dealing with sensitive topics, prefer the one-on-one -on -one in depth interview rather than focus group discussion. Also be mindful, ask your participants regarding the venue of the interview. Culturally, here in Asia, if you go to the home of the participant, there is a tendency that the neighbors will come. We are uh, we are communal, and we are the houses are very close to each other. So we had this experience when we were doing the teen motherhood study. The neighbors came, so uh, we decided not to continue with the interview. We found another place. The other one also is safety of the researcher. Uh, sometimes we, you know, Pavel, we, we emphasize on the importance of the safety of the participants. We forget the safety of the researcher. And I remember my experience when I did my master's thesis, I collected oral literature. And somebody told me that in that mountain, there's a place there like a, 
a compound where there are the parents and the children saying there they are singers of uh of you know ballads and really some even they composed on their own so i went there but it was very far and there the the session was very long they sang songs and they recited in our place we call it loa l o a but it's joust joust and so when we were done it was already late afternoon it was almost twilight and so they said sleep here we slept there but i didn't sleep the whole night i was very scared so I, I now said, okay, you, yeah, so that is what is meant. By us researchers, we should be very mindful. So how do we do that? Firstly, we always encourage that we conduct quali our uh, qualitative research as a team. Do not do that solo and also uh, gather data during daytime and coordinate with gatekeepers, have a local team members. And uh, the other one here, of course, is the emotional burden. And why is that uh, very significant for sensitive topics? Because we can be emotionally burdened. And I want to emphasize here, do not share with your spouse. Do not share with your friends. So you have to keep it by yourself. But the good thing is, if you are a team, then you can do debriefing. Next slide, Pavel. I think we only have a few minutes more. Yes, uh, there's this zone of the untouchable. Uh, yeah, how do, are you willing to cross the line, especially if the data is not relevant to your topic? Okay, the next slide. Uh, we will talk about beneficence. This is another component of the ethical framework of Amdor and Bunker. That is that uh, in doing research with marginalized group on sensitive issues, ask yourself, uh, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Because of if the, there is more harm that can be done, then our stand is to not do the study, okay? <laughs> because uh, uh, people are very important, okay? So minimize the harm at what, what harm can uh, happen to our participants, mental and, and also to us researchers, mental harm, physical harm, emotional harm. And here we just put participants, but we add uh, also to the researchers. And the next uh, element component of this framework, Pavel, the next slide, uh, is just this. May yes. just, they may just add here for the beneficence. Um, you know, um, I'm a part of the ethics review board and uh, uh, when uh, sometimes studies come to the board and uh, we have these issues of uh, uh, sensitive uh, moments, as uh, I mentioned, um, well, uh, one student, uh, he was doing conducting research among the uh, victims of, uh, of a massacre in uh, Rwanda, um, in genocide. And um, we were asking, uh, how are you going to, to discuss with your participants about, uh, you know, these uh, wounds and uh, how, you know, uh, uh, their relatives died because of that, uh, of that genocide. And um, we asked uh, that uh, we actually required that he had a, a licensed psychologist with him to assist in the study, because sometimes we have to provide uh, professional uh, you know, assistance in the studies when it gets to uh, very sensitive areas. So this just to mention that uh, it might be, we may not recognize the harm unless we know the area. I mean, then we know this yeah. uh, professionally. Yeah, oh. and this is justice. Mm -hmm. Yes, for justice, it's just ensuring that when we do research, we give everybody a chance to participate. And I think conducting research with marginalized group is, groups is one way that we address uh, justice because we are giving voice to you know, these people. And especially when we are very conscious to give them the ability to express and so uh, there are studies, I read one study on uh, 
about war and the participants were children and how the researchers enabled the participants to speak. And I want to put speak in quotes was to um, the medium here was mask making. The participants uh, did masks. And mm -hmm. another way, uh, usually for Pavel and me, how we do this, how we empower marginalized groups. Uh, well, I mentioned photo voice is one of our uh, methodologies. The other one, of course, is using arts-based data that mm -hmm. will complement. There are maybe uh, participants who cannot fully express themselves. And so through art, they can express their reality. So uh, be sure that when we conduct research, we, we, we give people who have uh, whom, whose realities we want to understand, we give them the voice. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide, Pavel. Mm -hmm. So here uh, I'm, I'm drawing this concept of ethics in practice from the works of Brinkman and Kivali and Gilyemen and Gilyam and also Tolly. And I'm remembering now also the work of Elias. Uh, these authors emphasize that, yes, we follow procedural ethics and Pavel mentioned about, uh, how do you call that one, Pavel? Um, review mm. board, uh, ethics it's review board, board. Yes. yes, ARB or IRB, and we submit our work. But in the field, when we go there, especially with uh, marginalized groups who are uh, dealing with sensitive issues, uh, there are ethical moments that will arise, moments that you do not predict. But what do you do? So uh, some of this you have not really outlined in your uh, ethical as approved by the ERB. Uh, but, you know, uh, I remember uh, Dr. Tolik mentioned about having a reference group. This is a person or a group of persons where to, with whom you can call or uh, consult. But usually, uh, one way to do this, if you are a novice researcher, is really to go with somebody who is already experienced. And also the other one is that we should practice ethical mindfulness, okay? Uh, there are several elements of ethical mindfulness, and that is our ability to recognize that Yes, okay, this one, this is an ethical, important moment. And also sometimes, you know, you cannot, uh, there are moments when you feel uneasy. Uh, that is like your intuition as a researcher, something is not right. So be be alert to that, that one. And also you articulate what is ethically important with your team and be reflexive and also be courageous to do what you have to do. Like for example, uh, uh, you can say, uh, do you want me to turn off the recorder? Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like us to continue talking about this? And you want to inform your participant, this one is not relevant to my data anymore, but would you like to, uh, to disclose this with me? And uh, so this, uh, this, uh, this is a concept that as researchers, we, uh, we encourage that we should understand, you know, this ethics in practice and ethical mindfulness. Okay, next slide. Um, this is the end. Uh, uh, I will just conclude the, the, our presentation. Dr. Sale, if you allow me, um, I will just uh, quote uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky in uh, Brothers Karamazov when he say that we all are guilty for everything, for everybody and before everybody that and me more than anyone else, everyone else. So that emphasizes that 
you know, we as uh, researchers, we need to, to hold responsibility. We need to understand our responsibility for the life of other. Although sometimes uh, people uh, don't show it, but uh, it can be also uh, a problem that we may not even sense. So um, this is something that we need to learn uh, as researchers develop this uh, ethical mindfulness, as already mentioned. Uh, so concluding our research, our uh, presentation, I would like to mention the, the beautiful verse from the Bible, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42 and verse 3, uh, when his, Isaiah speaks of, of uh, the future Messiah. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flux he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. And I think this is the essence of our presentation today, that um, we we don't want to to make uh, a life of the people worse after we we enter their life. We want to uplift them. We want to empower, encourage them uh, to um, uh, to work, to strive, to uh, prevail in their situation. Uh, trust and rapport must be developed with the participants, and is essentially required throughout the research process. Uh, yes, establishing these trustworthy relationships is very important. Ensure that the informed consent form uh, in, is obtained prior to the commencement of the research and reestablished during the research process. Make sure that the participants are clearly informed and that they have the rights to withdraw from the research at any point of time. Uh, ensure that the participants are respected and that their dignity remains intact throughout the research process. Terminating research process and withdrawal from the field must be dealt with tactfully and sensitively. Inform the participants that they have right to check on how they are represented in transcripts and writing. This is what Dr. Asel already mentioned about member checking. And finally, be cautious about potential harm to the research participants and prepare the necessary safety net if, uh, uh, of support if needed. So with this, uh, probably we will conclude. Uh, Dr. Sely, you may want to say something in the end. Uh, this is the end of It's OK, Pavel. I think it's now time for our question and answer. Thank you for uh, listening to us. And now we would like to, uh, to engage in our uh, Q&A conversation. <laughs> 